test here. Welcome back to day two of the happy birthday free training. I am super excited today to welcome Bradley Sowash and Jeremy Siskind. So thank you to both of you for um, agreeing to work with us on happy birthday. And this is the kickoff event for Piano Connect, which is going to happen January 28th through the 30th. So it's an online virtual retreat for creative piano players. And I've assembled some really incredible teachers from around the world, such as Bradley and Jeremy. Uh, we have Arena Gorin, Samantha Coates, Leela Viss. Um, have I forgotten anybody? Hope I haven't forgotten anyone. Myself. What about Paula? Yeah. <laughs> Paula. <laughs> and uh, we're all presenting and teaching on different topics like um, free improvisation, composition, if you're just getting your feet wet with composing, um, how to play by ear, which is super exciting. A lot of people are lacking that skill with classical pianists. And uh, Jeremy's and Leela will teach about making beautiful arrangements. So it's just full of amazing content that really you could watch the recordings and take one presentation per month and have that be your full year of professional development. But it's really fun and there's concerts, yoga classes, cooking demonstrations, um, a lot of breakout rooms where you can get to know people. So if you're interested in joining us, uh, someone popped a link in the comment, it's pianoconnect.org. We would love to see you. So our first uh, workshop today is with Bradley Sowash, and he'll work with us for a bit. And after that, we're going to pass it over to Jeremy. So thank you so much, Bradley, for working with us today. Okay. I take that as my take it away uh, cue. You know how everybody says on National Public Radio, they say, um, oh, you know, welcome, Bradley. And, and then they say, thank you for having me. That's like the go to. Thank you for having me. So just as an upfront bit of humor, my mother had a radio show way back in when most live music, um, lots of live music was was live and there wasn't much recording going on. And um, I, every time I hear that, I think, wouldn't it have been funny if I could have been a guest on my mother's radio show? And then when she welcomed me, I could say, thank you for having me. So, you know, that would be a... Uh... That would be awkward. Anyway, so we're going to hit happy birthday. I assume you already know how to play it. And I'm going to show you how to make a nice variation on it. Um, and the reason you might want to do this that I found in my, um, I, I've been saying 30 years, I looked back, it's like I, I played gigs for 40 years for a living full time, gigs and concerts, and then started to um, teach and then crossfaded into mostly teaching and just playing once in a while. Uh, and in that process of playing gigs, there's always that occasion where you have to play some kind of tune for the occasion, such as the anniversary waltz or, uh, you know, happy birthday or a Christmas song or whatever. And if they sing along, they often sing along sort of badly or whatever and, and get through it. And then it's just ends. And it, it there's that weird, awkward space that we just experienced after my dumb joke, where there's this hole in the social fabric. And so by stretching the tune into a new style, the band or the solo pianist could take it over and stretch the tune a little while as the party sort of leaked back into um, full force. So this is what I'm going to get into today is how we would stretch Happy Birthday after we've played it. And just to share the screen for a minute, I'm going to be using the chords that are uh, just standard chords here. So maybe I'll just play this one time on my piano here down below me um, in a sort of a real square way. F to C. Stay on C. Stay on F. And this has to be said, this is one of the weirdest harmonizations in a uh, commonly enjoyed popular culture in that we have an E against this B flat. It's really quite dissonant and pretty surprising that we accept it, but there it is. The reason I mention that is if you're trained with theory, this is a point where at least I um, find it hard to play the B flat when I'm just not remembering the chords. I think, oh, it's an E, it must be a C7 chord, but it isn't because that's sort of a, a suspended sharp four or something. It's just really surprising for such a simple folk song. So we're going to be using just those simple chords 
And, and we've played that and everybody's like, happy birthday and for he's a jolly good fellow and all that kind of stuff. And then we're back to the, to the tune. So what does the band play? I'm going to show you what they might do first and then I'll break it down for you. So um, let's just have a listen. I'll, I'll show you my piano in a minute, but let's just enjoy what, you know, what might happen to do, 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 do. And then everybody claps. And on this chord, I would set up the groove. Look at the drummer. And and I do something like this. I'd have something with me. So can you hear the uh, piano? Okay, can you just give me a quick thumbs up, Paul, or whatever? Is the music coming through pretty well? It could be just a little bit louder. I okay. can hear it, but uh, it could be a little louder. I'll goose the piano. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to walk you through how to do a Latin version of this. That And Latin, that just needs to be said, is a, a sort of an American way of describing a very rich and diverse musical culture that includes all kinds of things like calypso and tango and uh, uh, New York salsa music and Brazilian sambas and bossa novas. It's a very wide term. And a lot of times j jazz players will just say Latin and it's just generic meaning. Let's do some of the cliches from those many styles. And that's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to show you this in three steps. I'm just going to hit it in a basic version. Then we'll look at an intermediate way to play it. And then I'll show you some little bit more advanced tricks. So, so the first thing that we did here, and just type it in the in the in the chat. What did you notice uh, about the melody and the? I don't want to give it away. The the <laughs> the length of the measures. So let me just look in the chat there for a minute. Uh, yes, we have time signature. Time signature went to four four. So a lot of times on a three four tune, you know, it's just we're not going to play a waltz uh, all the way through to the party because let's face it, 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 we don't live in 19th century Vienna and, and Strauss has kind of lost some of his influence and, and the, the crowd is not going to go into their corporate party uh, by, by doing a waltz. And so I'd like to do something more contemporary. Today I chose Latin you know, very deliberately, frankly, because I just started a, a new course series of uh, eight classes over 16 weeks on Latin Jazz 1 for Jazz Newbies and then Latin Jazz 2 for more advanced jazz players. So when you go from 3-4 to 4-4, four, four, just make a little mental note, you want to stretch the tune, not reduce it. We don't want to um, sort of go to 2-4 or chop off beats, just add a beat and take a little extra time. And then um, we're going to start with by just the first thing you could do under that melody is put a bass line. And, and the bass line that, that we are going to, to use is, is played two ways. There's a, just to give them some fun names and sound like I know what I'm talking about. It's played as a habanera rhythm, which is a kind of a Cuban rhythm, uh, and, or tresillo, T-R-S-E-I-L-L-O. You may know this better as, say, like a rumba rhythm, which is a, a dance, the rumba, not, not so much a rhythm. So it's that three, three, two, or that long, 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 short sound. And of course, you find this all over the place in, as early as Scott Joplin's Solace, uh, his Mexican Serenade, or way back in the 1900s, you find that what Jelly Roll Morton called the Spanish tinge. And, and it'll show up in W.C. Handy's uh, sort of tango that's buried in the middle of St. Louis blues. It's been around a while, but it was really um, became a bigger deal 
um, in a little later, particularly when the Brazilian influence started to enter American jazz sound. And so we're here that that bass line, it sounds something like this. Right? Or it might be with that rhythm. Let's just take a quick look at that rhythm. Um, because one of the things about this is it's perceived by us as a as a some kind of syncopation. Um, because we were not reared in this style, but it really is the ground beat of a lot of Latin music. In other words, it is not two sets of four, four. If we think about this, just for one measure of music, you can see here, I have some divots here in this rhythm board. So this is one and two and three and four and, and we're, we're used to thinking about music as, um, you know, one, two, three, four, and, and everybody's even and, and organized. In the Tresillo or, or Brazilian, sound we're going to have this rhythm uh b right here one two three one two three one two if we're counting eighth notes one two three one two three one two and if we uh i realize it's a little dark for the screen today so i'll bring this up so i just give into your head that this is your basis this isn't a weird rhythm if, if you were to see this notated it 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 would come off as as something that is syncopated and strange um, so it might be notated. Here's the chords to happy birthday, by the way. Um, we, we would often notate this correctly in uh, our musical system like that, which gives the eye a sense that there are three different sounds here. You know, there's this dotted chord. Oh, that's one and a half beats. And oh, that starts on the end of two. And gee, it goes for a while. We could see it that way. But it's really felt much more like this. Just two sets of three and a two beat in terms of eighth notes. So that's not correct notation to have dot a quarter, dot a quarter, quarter, but uh, like choir members, for example, tend not to be great rhythmic readers. So when I write this rhythm for choirs, I actually write it this way because they can see that the first two are the, the same. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, or long, long, short. And what you're gonna play in the left hand is a root on one and a fifth on the the middle note the second long one one two three one two three and what you play on the last note per measure can be either the root or the fifth and it could be in any octave so these are all variations of the of this same rhythm let's just take a look at it just the fifth we could play the fifth up and then down Also go down first. Um, and we could even go back to the root. So the, all of those satisfy the, the base function of showing that ground beat rhythm and also uh, suggesting the chord. Notice there are no, no thirds in there. It's all uh, just roots and fifths. So the roots on one and the, the, the fifths are um, on are the other options and those can even be also roots so it would be possible to play it like this let's see if i can get more contrast here no not right now so if the first thing to do is put that bass line this would be the basic way to make this into a latin piece uh, and i'll go ahead and put a bossa nova beat on my piano here just with a bass line one two one two I played one, I blew it on the B flat chord, and that happened because I'm looking at Leela's 3-4 hand out here. So I'd probably be better off to, um, to look at my own, own chords. I got my eye just took over my ear, and that is a little less than a teachable moment there in that we are, our eye tends to dominate all our other senses. And when we're improvising, one of the best things to do is get that music away from your, from your eyes, because especially as reading musicians, we want, to, we want to play what we see. And that's exactly what just happened there. Um, so we have that little cognitive dissonance. Um, so there's, that would be the basic part of it here. So right now, let's just review what we've done so far and I'll tell you what we're going to do next. 
Um, we, 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 what we did so far is we took a three, four tune, stretched it into four, four time. And then we added a, a, a bass line associated with Brazilian Latin music. And um, I like to call it the Tresillo um, rhythm, though that rhythm can happen in any instrument, um, or some people refer to it as a rumba. Um, we, we know this sound. It's, for those of you who have a little more Latin training, it's the first half of a two measure clave. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that was just an, an aside. Bradley, so can you the, tell you how do you spell Tresilla? T R E S I L L O. Okay. Um, um, so Thank it's you. based on a habanero rhythm, which is very, very similar. Uh, I'll go ahead and show that real quick. Um, uh, or it's not based on, but the, the variation on it is so simple. It just adds another beat here. This is more the Cuban uh, way. So if we tie this note, it's a little bit more Brazilian. And that's all give and take and loosey-goosey just um, because this is a, a, an art form that is enjoyable to play as non-practitioners of the true sound. We can have some fun with it and just get the generic Latin sound going. So we're going to move on to intermediate now um and and i'll do it first and then i'll show you what what uh what i'm doing um so we'll do it first this way see if you can pick out what is different about my right hand uh, so one two a oh, one two At the chat here diana's got it she's cheating because she's had two or three lessons with me i call those hang chords hang chords means that you you put the rhythm i'm sorry you put the the most easily grabbed uh notes from the chord under the melody note they need to be under for the ear to understand them so this note e is in a c chord well it's simple for me to grab a bit of a c chord one or two notes maybe three so I could play that or just this or this. And so when the chord changes, it's not necessary to keep it going the whole time. You could uh, put a little chord on there. So um, something like this. So just aiming for downbeats or chord changes as opposed to this. That's too many chords. Just throw a little bit of hanging the, the right hand melody chord down off the 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 melody and that is a bradley word um, i think jeremy can correct me if, if i'm wrong but um i'm just worried that if you go into your theory class and say hey i want to play some hang chords you might get a funny look the idea is just hanging the notes off the melody there um and then in in the intermediate phase we're looking at the next thing i wanted you want you to practice um is to play offbeat black chord accompaniment um, and let's just do that without the the bass line, without the melody, just for a second. And so, so uh, it sounds like this, just on an F chord. One and two. If that's you know, if it's too fast, let me pull this down to like 120. Uh, so um, you're playing one and two and three and four and one and and so if we think about that rhythmically. Now, there's something happening on beat ones. It tends to be the bass. So let's go ahead and put the bass here that we're playing. And let's regard this as our left hand. It'll come into focus here in a minute, I think. And um, uh, come on, camera. Yeah, I got to convince it to look at this. Okay. And then um, the right hand is just playing these chords all on and beats. Um, let's see. And, and, and. We could just do there. One, two, and three, and four, and one, two. Or you could play all of them as and beats, letting the bass cover the one. So one, um, this is the bass line. Don't gain, gong, ding, gain, don't. Right hand is playing one and, 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 one and, 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 or off beats. One off, 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 on, off, off, off. So get that down. You can practice it just like this at first. And then, 
when you put the bass line back in, it's kind of convenient because the second note of the Tresillo rhythm lines up with the uh, with the chord right there. So it's not too hard. Let's go to B flat or C7. And then for B flat. Any inversion is fine for practicing the hands working together. So what we will do then is take the advantage of the pauses in the tune. Happy birthday to, to you. We have this big space in 4-4. Four, four. Well, that's a great time to throw in some of those and chords like this. There's my F. Whenever it's convenient, So right in the end there, I picked up some of the ands with my left hand because it seemed like my right hand was busy. And that's a key point. You want to make this uh, comfortable. It's don't go turn yourself into circles to get all these elements going. Just when it feels good in the bottom of the hand and it seems possible, throw in some hand chords. When there's a big space in the melody, put a little bit of accompaniment. And the effect is that the listener, instead of hearing a piano player play, you know, just um, sort of um, lots of notes, they're hearing lots of layers. So we hear this bass line, we hear this, and we hear the melody. So we have we have a sense that there's a bassist, uh, maybe like a guitar, doing gink, 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 and, a, and a, a singer or a melody player, all within this mini orchestra that I like to call a hand band. So, so that would be an intermediate way to approach that. And of course, if someone's singing, we could um, just go off and, and, and just play those chords underneath there. So let me see if there's any questions and I'll show you a few advanced tricks um, to, to make it a little bit more fun here. You finally put in the G minor, says Judy. Yeah, I'm trying to keep this really straight. Um, I also played a B diminished a minute ago. Let's look at those chords again uh, for a second. Uh, to be honest, I, it was hard for me. I, sometimes I play a B diminished right here, just out of habit. And the F is over C, um, and 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 this can also be a G minor here. So you might I might find my hands. Uh, I think every <laughs> I I think Jeremy will be nodding in in appreciation. And Paul, you try to teach an improv concept, and you try to keep clean, but you end up doing other stuff in your fingers and your that are habituated. Um, okay, so I'm just going to wrap it up by showing you this a couple of advanced tricks that we're working on in Latin Jazz uh, 2 online class. And this has to do with rocking those chords. So instead of doing this, we're going to go like this. Um, so... So I'm rocking between thumb and the top two notes. And they're mostly off beats. We, I'm not going to drill down on that rhythm too much right now. And the, and the rhythm can be loose. Um, so you're converting your, your uh, off beat chords to something like a broken chord, but it's more like a, a bottom of the chord, top of the chord in any inversion. Um, and then just to take it, give you a little glimpse into how you can really stretch this by playing around with your thumb notes, you can do some nice things. Often it's a seven, six pattern. So this is getting a little advanced here, but instead of playing my thumb on F, I'm going to play it on E. I'm not worried about it if it's a major seven or not. I'm just worried about that I'm in the key. So listen, keep that rhythm going, but I'm going to oscillate my thumb between the seven and the six below the root. What a sound. We're going to recognize this. So that really starts to sound very Latin.
here it's sometimes should I use the seven? Should I use the six? It doesn't matter a whole lot. So, so that was a little bit of uh, just pushing through. Um, when I'm not sure what to do, I'll just push through, play a little scale or something. And you can mix and match those. Now, one more little trick. If you take that same pattern, and you, and you double the thumb notes, and again, I'm doing this a quick, uh, a quick demonstration behind the curtain. That's something I'd work on a lot more carefully in, 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 you know, given more time. But we're gonna take that same idea and we're gonna break it up. Okay, and then you can even double the thumb note in your pinky and we get this wonderful Latin sound. So I'm just taking this idea of the motion in the thumb and the pinky and turning it into kind of a solo, kind of a slow melody. Something like that. Seven and six is a good reach, good thing to go for, but the line is more important than being true to the keeping the seven, six in your thumb. So you just try to play a little melody. Um, so let me check the the the, uh, the chat here real quick, and then I'll just play a second more to give you one more time of a sort of full blown version. Let's see if there's any questions or anything. I'm I'm thinking I probably lost a few of you in that advanced part, but let's review. This is what we did. The basic steps were to stretch three four into four four and add a typical Latin bass line. The intermediate steps were to add offbeat block chord accompaniment and hang chords. I should have said hang chords first, adding hang chords under the melody and then working with those hang chords to get them off beat. And then the advanced idea was to rock on those chords, do, de, do, de, de, perhaps varying the thumb with seven and six or other nearby notes. And then the very advanced idea was to convert those into stretched broken chords um, with, with motion that's doubled from the thumb and the pinky. So there's Lots of stuff there to explore. The, the, you don't need to do it all to have a good time with this tune. Let me take it out with, with a little bit of um, one more time through it and I'll see what I can do here. Yeah, I'm feeling this a little quicker, so I'm gonna pick it back up. So uh, again. Here's where you want to cue your drummer or hit your buttons. fun with that and enjoy your 
creative Latin music making journey. Thank you. I see a couple of bit of applause there. I'll hand it over to Paula. That was amazing. I think everyone just, some people spontaneously started clapping. Some people were dancing. What a treat. That was so much fun to, to just hear Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Come with it at the end. Thank you so much, Bradley. So as you saw in the chat, Bradley teaches online classes. So if you're interested in taking one of his classes, the links were provided there and I'll put it with the recording. And um, you can see how much fun it is to just learn from, from these people. So if you want to experience something like this again, I highly encourage you to join us in Piano Connect. And uh, so you also saw Bradley has the the beat, I don't, do you call them beat boards or I forget what yeah, they're Yeah, yeah, the built-in rhythms in this, yes. this ancient old piano, but I love the push button rhythms, makes yeah. it easy. So there's so much you can explore on, on his website and he has books that he's written. And uh, so thank you so much, Bradley, that was very helpful. So next we're gonna move on to Jeremy Siskind. He, he does similar things to Bradley where he teaches online, his is through um, a university and he has books that he has written about jazz. He has an amazing YouTube channel that is really, really helpful. So I encourage you to go to his website, jeremysiskin.com. I'll put that in there and learn more about him. So thank you so much for joining us, Jeremy, and uh, take it away. We can't wait to learn from you. Awesome. Uh, can everybody give me some kind of a sign if you can hear me? Give me a thumbs up, a wave, uh, something, okay. Great. Um, let's just do this. Cool. And everybody should be able to see my keyboard, myself, as well as um, I got inspired by, by Bradley and I wrote out happy birthday in 4-4 uh, for you all while, while he was uh, teaching it. Because it, uh, I completely agree with Bradley that we need a little bit more room than 3-4 if we're going to do much um, with happy birthday. So I think I want to start by just playing a little bit just to get some of my own heebie-jeebies out and just being an obnoxious show off um, and maybe getting some ideas, giving some ideas about where we might head. So can everybody hear the piano okay? show off thing showing off there we go that's the word i'm also realizing as i'm as i'm doing it that my my girlfriend's in the other room and i have not told her i'm doing a class on happy birthday so she probably thinks that i've completely lost it <laughs> um so i did want to start with the blues um and you know if you wanted uh, just like bradley if you wanted to maybe do a little happy birthday variation after you played it once or if you want to do kind of a special version for a friend um, or an enemy, you know, whatever. We're non-judgmental here. Um, adding some blues would be great. And a few pointers as you're adding in some blues. The first thing that we usually do when we make something bluesy or give it a blues characteristic is we just take all these chords and unless it conflicts with the melody note, we're just gonna make them dominant chords. So instead of an F major, nice happy chord, 
we'll add a dominant seventh. Right? Instead of, you know, this C chord might have already been a C7. But we'll make sure we have the dominant seventh there. Dominant seventh. of those chords the first thing that we can do to give it a bluesy flavor is simply change them from major to dominant um and let's just take a second and pause there because it's really bizarre <laughs> um like if we know anything about dominant chords and i'm looking at the people here and i know that you do know things about dominant chords we know that their one function in western music theory is to resolve to serve as the five chord so that at the end of our opera or symphony or sonata we can go <laughs> five ones. Um, and here I'm telling you that even this very last chord, um, this F chord at the end, I want to be dominant. Which shouldn't work. But the reason that it does, in my humble opinion, is that the blues is not a Western musical system. It does not um, have anything to do with Western music theory. So we're grabbing things from other musical traditions. And therefore, this F7 at the end doesn't feel like it should resolve to be flat at all. In fact, it just sounds like it's an F7 colored in the tradition of the blues. Um, so don't bring your Western theoretical preconceptions to the blues. It actually won't fit. Let me give you a second example of why the blues um, kind of doesn't fit with what we usually, uh, what we've learned in Western music theory. In Western music theory, generally, we think of kind of each chord having a scale that goes with it, more or less. If we have a C major chord, we're going to play a C major scale. If we have a G minor chord, we're going to play some sort of a G minor scale. It could be melodic, harmonic, whatever. Uh, and then we go to an F major chord, and we're probably going to use the F major scale. Um, in the blues, we have this scale called the blues scale, sometimes referred to as the minor blues scale, for reasons we'll see in a second. And when we have this minor blues scale, it goes with the key rather than with each individual chord. Okay, um, and you might notice that the um, the chord tones, as compared to the major scale, are the one, the flat three, the four, and we can call this one the sharp four, the flat five is the tritone, the five, and then the flat seven, that dominant seventh again in there, right? And you guys know this, this scale has what we call blue notes, which are these notes that rub up by a half step against the notes of the chord. So I'll leave that partially on the screen so that if you're copying down, you can still do that. If we wanna do a, ver a bluesy version of Happy Birthday, besides number one, changing all the chords to dominant seventh chords, it would be fun to use this scale to improvise. Now, just in case you did not believe me, that this scale goes with all of these different chords for the entire form. Um, let me play the scale as I go through these chords. So we're going to start with F. Right. rubs up against those chords in ways that, you know, if you're looking for very clean Mozart-like harmony, um, it's not there, right? It's a different kind of a rub. Um, but it's a rub that we're used to and we want, we crave <laughs> in the blues, okay? Um, so how I would use this scale is I would, just like Bradley was saying, in the moments of rest, I would add some fills using this scale, maybe like so. Okay, so I played the 
melody, held out the chord. You know, you could think of it as a little short cadenza if you're coming from a very strict classical tradition. You're taking a little cadenza, you're improvising just a bit of blues um, using the blues scale, and then you're coming back. And um, it often works best if you lead in to the next part of the melody. So notice it's not that I'm playing the melody. Actually going to work best if you kind of aim towards the next phrase. Right? So I'm actually kind of targeting the lead in notes into the next phrase and trying to use that blue scale. Now we're going to come back to that blue scale. I'm going to show you some tricks to make it sound more in the blues style. Because um, you'll notice that there's, there's kind of some. Uh, well, I, for lack of a better word, just kind of typical stylistic things that we do with the blue scale that are good tricks. But before we do that, I want to show you an alternate way that's maybe a little bit less full of conflict and rubbing, <laughs> um, which is what the scale that has many names, which is, I, I think of it simply as the F pentatonic with the flat third added. So everything is the pentatonic scale except this G sharp, which is the raise second or the flat third, depending on how you want to think about it. Um, a lot of teachers I know call this the major blues scale. I don't love that name because the blues is not really either major or minor. Um, so, but it can be helpful to distinguish between these two scales by calling this one the minor blues scale or this one the major blues scale. And then um, I have two names that I, I learned from Bradley Soash, the sweet scale, and the bright blue scale. Did I get that right, Bradley? I don't use sweet, but bright and dark blue. Okay. Yeah, but um, I like it. I, I have. I heard sweet somewhere else. Then <laughs> that may have been Forrest. That could, uh, that could have been Forrest Kinney. It sounds like one of his words. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to give you credit. Uh, but th this scale is a little sweet. bit more consonant. And where is that first scale? The minor blue scale goes with the key. This one, we do want to move around with the different chords, OK? So as we have an F chord, we'll play the major blue scale, sweet scale, bright blue scale, whatever you want to call it in F. And then as we get to the C chord, we'll use that same scale in C. And as we're in C. has a little bit of that blues flavor, um, but it doesn't have those really intense, dark, um, emotional rubs that you get in the other blues scale. So um, if, you know, if you uh, need a little bit more consonants in your life and you want to play a kind of happier, brighter version of Happy Birthday, maybe the second scale is a better choice. And I'll tell you, the great blues players, uh, whether you're talking about on guitar or on piano, uh, vocalists, they mix between these two scales. It's not just one or the other. These two scales are always kind of in conversation um, between the two. So let me demonstrate doing something very similar, playing the melody and improvising now using this bright blues scale, um, changing with each different chord. So. So you can hear that it's a little bit brighter, it's a little bit happier, but it still has that bluesy feel. Um, okay, now before I go on, I, I keep doing this thing at the end of the tune that you might be curious about because it really has that blues flavor, um, which is I'm going. And so all this is, and this is a great trick for harmonization, is that I've got this F chord, if you can look at my hands here. I've got Fs on the outside. I'm playing C, the fifth, A, the third on the inside, right? Um, 
So very consonant, very normal voicing. And then I'm just moving it first up by a half step. And that would actually be enough to make it very interesting. That gives you actually like a one to minor four back to one progression, right? But we can take this further, right? This is what jazz musicians are always doing. We're taking harmony that sounds nice, we're taking it too far. <laughs> um, so we could go two half steps. That's pretty bluesy. What if we went three half steps up? That's really nice. But what I'm doing is I'm going up and then going below. So I'm going below by a whole step and then coming in by two half steps. So it's all about taking that internal voice, that uh, that interval of a sixth, um, and moving that around without disrupting the interval. Okay, let's see. I'm seeing a couple questions in the chat. We need a little bit more context. Is that a book you published? Which book? I'm not sure what you're talking about here, Paula. Um, but I mean, if you are wondering about books I published, this is a good time to plug. Um, my baby's playing solo jazz piano with an introduction by the greatest jazz solo pianist ever, Fred Hirsch. Um, and then this new one called Jazz Piano Fundamentals, which is uh, intended for students in their first six months of learning jazz. So there's my plug since I had just the smallest opening. I think it was related to your beautiful quote, if you need a little uh, bit more consonants in your life. That's like your next book title. I, I love it. That could be my, bio, my, my autobiography. <laughs> um, so I promised you some, um, some idiosyncratic blues phrases and licks. So let me give you a few. Um, the first thing is almost too simple to say, but I, I feel like I should remind people that using grace notes is really important in the blues style. Okay. Grace notes are essentially simulating a pitch bend, right? We can't bend pitch on piano unless we're on some keyboard that has a pitch bend wheel. And even then, it doesn't really sound like when a vocalist bends a pitch or a guitarist bends a pitch. It ends up sounding weird and digital, right? So as pianists, we use grace notes. And even just this first phrase of the melody, I might choose to use some grace notes. Now, a few ground rules on grace notes. One. Typically, they will be half steps. Two, typically, they will be from below the note so that we're kind of scooping up into the note. Three, classical musicians generally play grace notes very cleanly. With like firm separation between the two notes. In jazz, we generally like to kind of blend sloppily. I shouldn't say sloppily because it's intentional. We like to overlap between the two notes. So if I'm playing, I'll really roll in from that C sharp to that D. We, we really want to give that feeling of a little scoop, an expressive scoop into a note. And to add to that, we won't always do only one grace note. Sometimes we'll do two or three or maybe even four grace notes, right? So if I'm looking at this very first melodic phrase, I might do two grace notes, C and C sharp, into this T. And especially when you have a big vocal reach, like this I really can't even sing that. So these grease notes are really key to an expressive or a bluesy style. So um, I encourage you, you know, we, you could even use one grace note per melodic phrase. Um, that won't feel like too much if you're doing it well. Um, second thing that we do is what I call turns. And um, I keep on asking my friends who are experts in Baroque music what the Baroque equivalent of a turn is. Um, and they, they haven't come up with a good answer for me. But a turn, I'll play it for you first, and then I'll explain it. All right, a turn 
in a certain sense is also kind of simulating a pitch bend. It's kind of like whoa, whoa. very stereotypical, very idiomatic of the blues style. So the way a turn works, let me show you using the F major scale. Okay, so there's the F major scale. If I were going to add some turns into the F major scale, I'll do it in slow motion. So what am I doing? I'm backtracking one note in the scale, and then I'm continuing through the original note. And because we're playing jazz, I like giving it a little swing. It's not super even, it's not, you know, it's not sounding like a march. It's with a little bit of a kind of rhythmic swing to it. So if you're at your piano, go ahead. You can try that on the F major scale. It might be like a mordant. Somebody told me a mordant was slightly different, but it's like a mordant. <laughs> Now that gets much more interesting as we're using the F blues scale, because now we get to go. And use the turns in that F blues scale, we get all these interesting intervals because the blues scale is really lumpy. <laughs> it's like got thirds in places, it's got half steps in places. And this is you know, as close as we come to simulating kind of a blues singer um, being really expressive with a yodel or a howl. But if we want to take it one step further, which we always do, I told you, we jazz musicians, we're always taking things one step too far, at least. <laughs> um, we can also add what we call, what I call double notes. Um, this is a great question that, that I'm getting in the chat. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Um, so double notes in jazz are usually notes that we place above the main melody to provide extra harmonic context, to provide, um, sometimes it kind of provides almost a distraction from a turn or something expressive that you're doing. So now watch my hand carefully. I'm going to do this in slow motion. But I'm adding a note about a fourth or a fifth above those. Right. Um, and if you listen to the great blues players, you know, um, on piano, um, we could think of early boogie woogie players like Pine Top Smith or Mead Lux Lewis or Pete Johnson or Jimmy Yancey. Um, but you know, I think a lot of it ends up coming through to us from people like Count Basie, Oscar Peterson, or Gene Harris. Um, they will be using these double notes. Some, some people call them double stops, like you know, as though you're playing a string instrument. Um, these kind of extra harmonizations all the time. Watch my hand. I'm gonna play a little bit of blues for you. <laughs> playing your melodies basically with your one, two, and three. <laughs> and then your fifth is kind of trailing along behind. And that's really common in this really blues drenched style. Um, this is a great question about ascending turns. And I have actually an easy, if maybe frustrating answer, which is that we don't do turns when we're ascending. Um, it's only for descending, or if we're staying in the same place, we will also commonly do a turn. <laughs> It doesn't actually work very well going up. It's just 
not the right expression for whatever reason. I, I don't have a great answer as to why that is. Um, but turds are really only on the way down. So it's a really good question. And I'm sorry if that answer is uh, not, uh, not what you want. <laughs> it's, all, it's all I got for you. Um, great, maybe just the last thing before I wrap up here, I, I could talk for five more hours. Um, but I did write out, and I'm happy to send this handout to Paula if, if she wants. There's not a ton of information here. Um, but, you know, if you want, so, so far I've been kind of suggesting that you play this rubato, right? Putting in little fermatas in each measure. Um, but it would be really fun to do it with a boogie woogie pattern as well. And, and here's two kind of common boogie woogie patterns. The first one's definitely easier. The second one's more challenging. So the first one's just alternating between one five and one six. <laughs> have to transpose it to each new chord as you change chords. So don't try to just play that in F the whole way. Um, the other boogie woogie pattern is definitely more complicated. I always think of this one as the octave swings. First we have an octave swing up and then we have an octave swing down, right? Here's the octave swing up in red and then here's the octave swing down, downward C to C in blue. So this takes a little bit more athleticism <laughs> in the left hand, but boy, it's fun. I'm, I'm uh, giving one of the Francis Clark piano stories on stage concerts at the end of February. Um, and I'm going to be doing it on boogie woogie piano and stride piano. So if you want to hear some more boogie woogie and learn a little bit more about boogie woogie, uh, that's a great place to do it. So um, I know I have to wrap up here and I do have a 10 o'clock lesson to get to. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm Jeremy Siskin. I'm very friendly. I think uh, they shared in the chat where to find me if uh, you want to see me more for some reason. Um, and thanks so much to Paula. I hope you all sign up for Piano Connect. It's going to really be a lot of fun. Um, Thank you, guys. Jeremy. Woohoo! Big round of applause. Thank you so much. If you could send me those handouts, I would love to include those with the recording. That'd be amazing. Thank you. It was very helpful. And it's always such a pleasure to, to listen and watch you play. So thank you. Any final questions for anybody before we say goodbye? What a fun way to start the day. All right, I think we're good. So thank you again to Jeremy and to Bradley and thank you all for spending your time with us. Someone is looking forward to your class, Jeremy. <laughs> Everyone's having, saying it was so much fun. Thank you. You're so welcome, Diana. Thank you for coming.